Now we get to talk about sex. Sexual intercourse, to be precise. Humans are a rather interesting species. We engage in sexual intercourse for a variety of reasons, um, reproduction being only one of them. We use sexual intercourse for physical and emotional pleasure, bonding, etc. Reproduction requires vaginal penetration with the penis and ejaculation. That should come as no surprise to anyone. The orgasm process, the process of these, this pleasurable rapid contraction of muscles in the sexual organs um, and pelvic region that occurs at the climax of sex, that is necessary for the males. It leads to ejaculation. Without that orgasm, you don't have ejaculation. It doesn't occur. But for females, it's not at all required for reproduction. Um, it is uh, likely something that we um, have, that we've evolved as a species, essentially to get the females to engage in sex. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's probably related then to um, desire, essentially, and encouragement of the, of the population for reproduction, but it, it's not necessary. And many women, most probably, do not orgasm each time they have sex. The involvement of sexual intercourse, one of the reasons that it is um, pleasurable is, is it activates the reward centers in our brain. We haven't had a chance to talk a lot about the brain. I, I spent most of the time talking about neurons um, and getting into the molecular details of the nervous system. And we really didn't spend a lot of time discussing the brain. Uh, emotions in particular, I didn't dive into that as much as I often like to do, uh, just due to time limitations in our class. So let me kind of briefly, briefly introduce to you the concept of emotions and a center in the brain called the limbic system. Now the limbic system isn't, it's not one neural net network. It involves a number of neuronal pathways that um, include um, the thalamus and regions near the brain. It, it tends to center around the uh, hippocampus, um, and of course it will extend into, it, it feeds back and communicates with portions of the frontal lobe, but in general speaking, um, this general region here is the limbic system. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, it doesn't show here. One of the important centers of the limbic system is the amygdala, which is responsible for our fear centers and our anxiety centers. But what we're really interested in is the dopamine release pathways. Uh, in terms of pleasure and reward, dopamine is hugely important. Hugely important. And in fact, as far as I know, and I can always be proven wrong, but as far as I know, every drug of addiction stimulates the release of dopamine in the limbic system. And it is thought that this dopamine plays a hugely important role in that addiction process. And this is why we often hear of other types of addictions, such as gambling addictions or sex addictions. And it, at the root, it's because these behaviors stimulate this release of, a, of dopamine, which creates this rush of euphoria. And that process is rewarding because and it will cause us to repeat that behavior. It is an advantageous process most of the time because we get this dopamine release in response to sex, which as a species is critical to the survival of the species and the, um, the passing on of our, of our genes, the genetic traits that we carry. Uh, which is essential to the whole survival of the fittest that we've all learned about when discussing the theory of evolution. Um, obviously, that dopamine reward pathway can be triggered by things that are not to our advantage. Addictive behaviors are not um, advantageous to us 
under most conditions. Um, certainly you could argue that sex addiction would, would, in a society that didn't have birth control, would in fact increase the probability that you would pass on your genetic, uh, your genetics, your genes, your traits to the next generation. And in terms of survival of the fittest, it really comes down to he or she who has the most progeny that survived to adulthood wins. That, that essentially amounts to how um, certain traits or characteristics persist within a population. Um, and so we have this reward center that's quite robust and it is activated during sex. There's another hormone that is also important, and, and it's a hormone that has, and again, remember that with science, 20 years is just, in, you know, the, the information is in infancy, right? 20 years is not a long time in science. 50 years is not a long time in science. Um, and so a relatively recent uh, awareness or discovery has, has centered around the hormone oxytocin which you will probably remember as being important in causing uterine contractions during childbirth as part of that positive feedback process. But it also is involved in causing smooth muscle contractions. Um, and it is during sex and it is going to be really important in the brain. It's released as a neurotransmitter in the brain too. So it's not just released from the anterior pituitary Okay, not just produced here, um, and it it affects neurons in the brain and is responsible for human bonding. This is sometimes called the love hormone, and it is also released during sex, and is one of the reasons why the whole concept of friends with benefits um, is is tricky because it's quite often that even if you're having you know, casual sex, that those bonding emotions, the, the oxytocin, um, facilitates the formation of a bond. I will mention that oxytocin is released under other conditions too, not just during sex. Um, you know, it's released when you're cuddling your child or you're gazing into the eyes of a puppy or a kitten or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, um, you know, it's not just a sex hormone, if that makes sense. Just like dopamine, it's not just a sex hormone. Dopamine is released during positive uh, interactions with other people, too. Um, but it is an important bonding hormone that creates those bonds. We're going to take a look at the erection reflex, or you might perhaps say the arousal reflex in both males and females and ejaculation. So we'll look at the males first. This particular diagram, uh, I don't know that I necessarily love it, but it is kind of the best I can find. This is from Pearson um, Education. And what it shows you here, let's kind of look at this and zoom in. And we'll begin, um, we'll begin here, okay? The higher centers of the brain um, can become excited based on just simple thoughts about sex or erotic stimuli. The arousal of the higher centers of the brain um, cause that information to be sent down these descending pathways. Okay, let's look at that. And the descending pathways in turn, note this, activate the parasympathetic nervous system activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, this can sometimes be a little confusing for students because we usually, when we think about arousal and increased activity, we usually automatically think sympathetic. But you'll, you may recall that when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, I used the terms rest and digest to describe the function of the parasympathetic nervous system, but I also include the, included the phrase feed and breed. And the breed part referring to sex. The parasympathetic nervous system is actually predominated for the erection reflex, 
um, or the arousal reflex during sex in the males and in the females. We're going to see similar pathways being involved in females. So the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated. Note this, that the sympathetic nervous system instead, look at that, it's inhibited. We're inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system. Why? Well, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, especially when the neurotransmitters bind to alpha adrenergic receptors, that leads to vasoconstriction. And during sexual arousal, what we actually get is more blood flow to the genitals, not less. Vasoconstriction would reduce the blood flow. The, well, and, and that's not what we see. We don't see a reduced blood flow. We see an increased blood flow to the, um, to the genitals. And so if we take a look at how that works then, is the parasympathetic nervous system, what it's going to do is it actually stimulates the release of, um, hormone. Remember the parasympathetic nervous system does not directly affect, it doesn't wrap around the arterioles. Think about our past discussion in the circulatory system. The sympathetic nervous system um, sends nerve fibers, nerve endings to the arterioles which control vasoconstriction and vasodilation. The parasympathetic nervous system does not, but it does trigger the endothelium or the tissue surrounding the blood vessels, in the blood vessels, the endothelial layer, it triggers that to release a chemical called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, we actually use it to treat cardiac pains, um, heart pains that might pretend, potentially uh, indicate or, or occur prior to a myocardial infarction. Uh, we treat it with nitric oxide, pop a pill under your tongue or a spray that opens up those blood vessels. And that's what nitric oxide actually does. It's released by the endothelial layers of the, of the uh, blood vessels and it causes the smooth muscles to relax and causes vasodilation. And that causes the, the spongy tissue in the penis, and as we're going to see later, or, you know, in the next few slides, in the um, clitoris, to become engorged with blood. We increase blood flow to the, um, the penis. And that creates the erection that we get in the males. And in the females, we actually have a similar response to arousal, not perhaps as dramatic, but we do end up getting engorgement of the vulva and the clitoris in response to a very similar process. Now, zooming in here, thoughts, of course, can re lead to arousal, but so can a mechanical stimuli, so can tactile stimuli, certainly touch can. And that occurs through, first through the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which then activates those ascending pathways. Okay, now the ascending pathways can travel all the way to the higher centers of the brain and essentially activate the higher centers that activate the descending autonomic nervous system. But the erection reflex is also a reflex. And remember that reflexes do not need, the reflexes occur without um, always conscious perception. Now with sex, you're going to have that conscious perception. Okay. But um, you also can get branches of that afferent pathway inhibiting the synth and, and it wouldn't directly inhibit remember it's going to synapse on to interneurons and those interneurons are going to inhibit the sympathetic nervous nerves and likewise you can get branches um, that are going to activate those parasympathetic nervous system and these would be the true reflex and does not necessarily involve conscious thought, conscious awareness. 
Um, and so you can actually get, in terms of physiology, and if you were to have, for example, a spinal cord reflex, I'm sorry, a spinal cord injury, people with spinal cord injuries can still often get erections because of this reflex pathway. Um, even if some of those ascending or descending uh, pathways are disrupted. Now, the corpus are the tissue that engorges with blood are the cor corpus spongiosum and the corpus cavernosus. If you're rusty on your anatomy, go and review that. Okay. Now, because of the pressure that is generated in the erection, the venules are actually compressed and the blood becomes trapped in that spongy tissue, um, generating a, an, a, you know, an erect and firm penis. Um, as just kind of an interesting aside, the popular drug, um, Viagra, was actually developed as a blood pressure medication to cause um, relaxation of the blood vessels to decrease total peripheral resistance in an effort to control blood pressure. The, the thing is though is um, it also helped with the arousal reflex. Um, in fact, that effect was even more robust than its effect on blood pressure. And so it began, that became this blockbuster drug um, to treat um, erectile dysfunction um, because it does enhance this process by essentially decreasing the resistance to blood flow uh, in the penis. Now... The erection reflex for males involves the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system is inhibited. However, during the process of sexual intercourse, as the stimulation continues, um, other parts of the sympathetic nervous system are activated. Your heart rate goes up, your respiratory go rate goes up. And it's not necessarily parallel or, or caused by the increase in physical activity. Certainly the increase in physical activity is part of it, but the heart rate rises more than a one would expect from the, the time in which one is physically more active. Um, in addition, as we reach the climax, the point of climax, at climax things kind of switch. The um, sympathetic nervous system then does become active, not necessarily the ones that control blood vessel diameter, but definitely the ones that feed into the smooth muscles in um, the reproductive organs. And as that sympathetic nervous system, those branches of the sympathetic nervous system, those neurons, those fibers are activated. We get this rapid contraction of the smooth muscles and that contraction then is associated. It activates the sensors that, that give us the perception of pleasure. But in addition, it has a very important functional effect as those smooth muscles spasm and contract. It creates the propul pro propulsion <laughs> causes the sperm. And remember that sperm is developed in the seminiferous tubules, right? These little structures right here. And that it is pushed out into the epididymis, right? And that it follows the path of the epididymis to the vas deferens, also called the ductus deferens. And the contraction of the smooth muscles force the rapid movement of sperm through the vas deferens. It travels through the vas deferens where it's going to reach or inter come to um, these seminal vesicles, which are going to create these secretions that will be added to the sperm. Chief among those is simply water, fluid. We increase the fluid volume, but also we get these other secretions, 
prostate gland will add to those as well. Um, this gland here is the cowper's gland, and that will also add to the sperm as it moves through those pathways, creating, forming semen. Um, semen is actually mostly all the other stuff and only a small percent of sperm. We take a look at that. What we see here is kind of a breakdown of what each of the different glands do. Um, and the secretions that are formed. So we get, of course, sperm produced in the seminiferous tubules. The bulbourethral glands, also known as the cal uh, Cowper's glands, are responsible for producing mucus, which is going to be a lubricant. All of the accessory glands produce water, creating volume to the semen. The prostate bulbourethral glands produce buffers, which are necessary because the environment of the vagina is acidic and that acid will kill the sperm and so if sperm are going to survive in order to um, fertilize the egg we need to neutralize that that acidity in addition we need nourishment and by that is secreted by the seminal, seminal vesicles the prostate um, and even the epididymis the nutrients involved are primarily nutrients that can fit into the citric acid cycle, fructose, um, citric acid itself, and uh, in addition, vitamin C and carnitine. These are all high energy sources, and you'll remember that sperm have a high need for ATP due to that mito, mito um, I'm, I'm sorry, due to the uh, flagella pushing and propelling the sperm forward. Remember that we've got a lot of mitochondria um, in the sperm uh, that is going to just generate AP ATP very, very rapidly. Now the seminal vesicles and the prostate also create or produce enzymes that um, have a very interesting effect in that they clot the semen in the vi in vagina and then liquefy the clot. This sounds weird, but by clotting the semen, it prevents it from flowing or I should say reduces the flow out of the vagina so that the semen can actually stay in there. But if the semen were to stay in its clotted state, then the sperm would not be able to travel through the female reproductive tract to the oocyte to fertilize the oocyte. So we have to do both. First clot it and then liquefy it. And that's done by the enzymes there. Zinc is released. We don't really know what its association is, although it might be associated with fertility. And then we get some the prostaglandins. Now the prostaglandins can uh, contribute to the smooth muscle contraction. Prostaglandins are interesting. They're interesting signaling molecules. Some of them actually signal um, pain, um, but they're also associated, and we're going to see these in other situations with smooth muscle contraction. So they're very interesting signaling molecules. I, I really haven't had a chance to talk much about them. Um, they're actually one of those acosinoids that if you think way back, uh, we talked about acosinoids as one of the types of lipids that are present in the body. They're formed from phospholipids. Now, interesting, this is important for you to remember, 98% of the plasma is semen, and of that, most of that is water. 2% um, is sperm, okay? Only 2% is sperm. Now, uh, I actually added this this year, but I, I think it's important to understand and focus also on the arousal reflex in females. So often in physiology, we just talk about the males, um, and yet the arousal reflex in females, while it might not be functionally necessary, certainly an erection is necessary for reproduction. There's, there's no question about that. Um, but females can reproduce without becoming aroused, uh, which is, I mean, that that's just the reality is that it can happen. But the arousal reflex is important for um, the health of the female and uh, that it is necessary for the pleasurable sensations of sex. Um, it has very similar, you know, from the nervous system perspective, very, very similar to the, the males in that we have the activation of the parasympathetic nerves and then and release of nitric oxide, vasodilation into this highly vascular um, rised uh, 
tissues. Sympathetic nervous system is inhibited to prevent vasoconstriction. Here's what I want um, to point out. Most of us, when we think of the clitoris, we think of just what actually is the glands of the clitoris. That's not going to show up. Let's try this. The glands of the clitoris. This is the part that we can see. This is the tip. And we can see a little bit of the clitoris body. Um, and most people, they know what that is. And as blood fills that region, it does become slightly more erect. But the clitoris is actually much larger than um, most people are aware of. And that it actually, under the part that we can't see, okay, contains, notice, a corpus cavernosum of itself. This is the spongy tissue that we associate with the penis. And in fact, developmentally, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but developmentally in the embryo, um, the process is the same up to about 10 weeks, at which point it's going to start to diverge. Um, the arousal reflex fills certainly the clitoral tissue. Mm, I need a better, a better color. We'll just go blue. Maybe that'll show up. Okay, certainly the clitoral tissue with blood, but also the bulb of the vestibular vestibule. And so you end up getting um, increased blood flow, not just to the clitoris, but also to the labia. And this causes the enlargement of the f uh, female genitals and increases the sensitivity as well. The arousal reflex in females also results in increased vaginal lubrication and um, what's sometimes referred to as tinting of the vaginal cav cavity, enlargement of the vaginal cavity. And all of that is also stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Orgasm in females is also due to the sympathetic nervous system, so it's very similar again to what we see in the males. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> so I can't think of anything else to say regarding that, except that um, I think that it's important to pay as much attention to the reflex in females as it is to males. And it's historically been something that has been overlooked uh, and honestly really shouldn't be. It's, it's as important to the reproductive health of the females as the erection reflexes in the males and should not be ignored just because it's not necessarily needed for uh, reproduction. It's certainly needed to make sex more comfortable and pleasurable for the woman that is involved. And that is important to building relationships.